The Grim Drive podcast explores mental health through the lens of professional sports and athletes. Pro athletes come forward more and more with stories about their mental health journey, what they have endured, and how they manage to push through, reflecting a mental health stigma that continues to be reduced. Pro athletes also leverage mindset to achieve peak performance, as well as representing and often driving elements of popular culture through the use of social media, technology, and personal branding. This places athletes front and center as role models for people of all ages, giving them a platform to reach many and deliver important information, including information about mental health. Welcome to the Grim Drive Podcast, where we explore mental health through the lens of professional sports and athletes. My name is Jotham Busfield. I'm here with my co-host, John Cuna. Today, we'll be discussing Ben Gordon and bipolar. So a couple of reasons why we chose Ben Gordon. I mean, I know from my personal experience watching him as a basketball player uh, when I was younger, he always stood out to me as someone, you know, at UConn and then also in the NBA. I think he was drafted initially by the Bulls. Yeah. So at UConn in college, I mean, he won a national championship there. Then he played in the NBA for the Chicago Bulls and was always someone who was just clearly like laser focused at all times. Like it really came through when you watched him. It almost seemed like nothing phased him. And I think hearing his story really changes how I view that because when I viewed it as a, as a more of a young athlete or I'm trying to think of exactly when he came out, but it was, yeah, I was younger. That's right. I was in my twenties. And I think viewing that at that time versus viewing it now based on the, the benefit of hindsight and him talking about his experience really comes through as two different, um, you know, viewing experiences because you know, he's someone who even refers to himself as, as silent or quiet Ben. And on the outside, you see one thing on the inside doesn't match up, mm-hmm. which we'll get into. So I think that was one reason the other reason is that he wrote a, a Players Tribune article that was really kind of forthcoming about his own difficult experience with bipolar uh, and with mental health in general and what he dealt with uh, after his playing career, which we've seen with a lot of pe- players that we've covered in terms of post, post-athlete life, what, it, what is their life like, and things tend to fall apart a little bit for different reasons. Um, so we wanted to focus on him as opposed to someone like Delonte West because Delonte West is, is also someone who um, you know allegedly struggles with bipolar disorder. I don't think we know for sure. Um, and that's one of the reasons we didn't want to focus on him. He hasn't come out and actually talked about his experience. Mm-hmm. It sounds like more recently, Delonte West has gotten connected to treatment and is working and doing really well with uh, with the help of uh, Mark Cuban, which is great uh, mm-hmm. that he's uh, back on his feet and, and doing things in, in a good way now and in a better place with his mental health. But Ben Gordon is someone who has come out and talked about his experience. And we always want to, you know, really focus on the people who have come to the forefront of, of the mental health uh, you know, topic and are willing to discuss uh, their journey. So that's one reason um, we, we chose ben, uh, ben Gordon. In terms of bipolar, I think as an issue, we've seen, we've talked about a few other athletes who have also struggled with bipolar or have struggled in the past and have that diagnosis. This is the first time we focused on this as an issue. We, you know, we focused on, I think, Robin Lehner. We talked about mm-hmm. PTSD. Um, and then Shemiko, Shemiko Holdsclaw, we talked about adjustment. Those are both people who also deal with bipolar. Um, and so it started to become a bit of a pattern with the, with the athletes we've talked about in, in some interesting ways, you know, mm-hmm. how bipolar actually helps them, you know, from an athletic standpoint or, or a mindset focus standpoint um, and different things that we saw kind of woven through a few of the athletes. So that's, that's one reason why we wanted to get into uh, bipolar as a mental health topic. Um, we also, you know, I know you agree with this, but you know, the, the term bipolar is just tossed around too often. I mean, we see that with, whether it's with young people or parents tossing it around, anytime someone has a bit of a mood swing, it's like, oh, maybe they're bipolar or that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it leads to a lot of overdiagnosis. And as we'll get into later on, you know, when it comes to the diagnosis of bipolar, medication plays a huge role, specifically on the manic side of things. And if someone doesn't have bipolar and then they're given that diagnosis and possibly put on like anti antipsychotic medications or things like that, you know, that you can see how that would be a huge issue. So yep. we're, we're pretty passionate about wanting to make sure people understand what this is and what it isn't. You know? Yeah. I, I, I think you make a great point. It's like a, one of those, one of those things that is sort of like those flippant comments, right? Like, Oh, you're being so bipolar. You're being so, you're being so this. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's one thing to add education to conversations and make these types of topics more widespread and more available for people, but it has to be done in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll get into like the criteria for bipolar. I think it's, you know, coming at it from like the clinical piece, I think is helpful. And, you know, I think because language is important and if we're using bipolar to, to describe a mood swing, that's not accurate. And I think like to your point, I think it leads to over diagnosing people or people being like, huh, maybe I am bipolar. And I go in, going into 
treatment, maybe saying I'm bipolar or things like that, and then putting them on medication that might not be beneficial for them, mm-hmm. and it can be really, really problematic. Yeah, and you see that a lot with with other terms like OCD and ADHD, where yeah. they're just tossed out. Yep. The littlest mm-hmm. thing that may be a minor symptom, and it's just not. We want to get to the place where people understand what they, these things are and what they're not yep. um, for a lot of different reasons. So quick bio on Ben Gordon. He's a British-American a former basketball player in the NBA. He played for 11 seasons in the NBA, drafted third overall by the Chicago Bulls. And he played college basketball uh, for UConn, where he won a national championship in 2004. Uh, a few interesting facts. I didn't know he was British-American, so I guess he was born in London uh, to Jamaican parents. He's the only NBA player uh, to have ever won the sixth man award as a rookie, which is pretty impressive. And he's second in career three-point field goals for the Chicago Bulls behind Kirk Heinrich. Um, so we always try to find a you know some kind of charitable organization that the player supports or donates to or, or you know pumps up on their social media platform that mm-hmm. kind of thing i couldn't really find one for for ben gordon um so we just put same uh the hashtag same here or the same here global.org uh, that's an organization that's you know really passionate about you know mental health global mental health awareness mm-hmm. um so we always like to plug that organization where we can so we put that in the show notes as well so in terms of you know ben gordon John, in reading, you know, his Players Tribune article and and maybe some other uh, sources about his experience. What were some of your main takeaways? Um, well, the the big one is uh, the you know he was pretty detailed in his Players Tribune, yeah. which was great. Um, it gave us a real insight into what he's been like, what he was struggling with, and what he, like what he thought it mm-hmm. was, and a lot of things came up. And the one that always stands out to me and we have these conversations all the time about like when the athlete steps away from the sport. Um, but his, his experience made me think about it in a different way. Um, that, you know, he talked a lot about, you know, his pregame stuff, he would sit down in in a quiet room and he would go, he would visualize his game for like the full 48 minutes from start to finish TV timeouts. I mean, he was said he was, was very detailed in his, his visualization work. And so it, it got me thinking about, how athletes respond when they don't have sports as their framework for their own mental health. Mm -hmm. And so not only did when he stepped away, he didn't have that physical outlet or rush of adrenaline or endorphins or that sort of like sense of purpose. And he always had a goal that was taken away. And then also his sort of like day-to-day mental hygiene and training of doing visualization work, which is Mm -hmm. therapeutic and important to sort of maintain a strong mind Mm -hmm. that also went away. And so not only did his sense of purpose leave also his mental training also left and vacated. And I think that created a perfect storm. And I think that a lot of athletes probably could relate pretty directly to that Mm -hmm. of when the sport goes away, things become more exacerbated because you don't have an outlet and you're not working on those skills. He probably didn't see it that way. And Mm -hmm. I bet most athletes probably wouldn't consider that, but I thought that that was an, that was an interesting takeaway that I got and got me really thinking about like bigger scheme or bigger, bigger picture of like what happens when athletes sort of don't have athletics, not just the, the rush of playing, but the structure and the training, not Mm -hmm. just physical, but mental as well. And so that was one of my bigger, that was probably my biggest takeaway, hearing him talk about the importance of that and how it potentially translates to when you don't have it. Totally. And that, that relates, I mean, it relates back to a couple of different episodes we've done, but the the one that stands out to me is uh, Shamiko Holdsclaw because she talked a lot. We talked about adjustment in that scenario. And, you know, I think at one point you and I were discussing how, you know, part one of the things that people can do to help with the adjustment process when you're going through a transition or when, you know, obviously it's a major transition to leave the game of basketball and have to, you know, translate that to life after basketball. When you're going, one of the helpful things you can do is try to bring some of the structure, bring some of the routines from your, your career, from your playing style, your playing life, that kind mm-hmm. of thing over to the next phase. I think right. it doesn't have to be a stark contrast between life as a basketball player and life as, after, a, uh, you know, after basketball, you want to try to bring as many of those things as you can. That's mm-hmm. not always going to be replicated 100%. Right. But he even talks about one of the things that helped him get better eventually was he started to do that. Like he he got back into the gym. He got back into mm-hmm. his routine, some of his routines. And he wasn't doing that to be a pro basketball player anymore. But he didn't need to, right? Mm-hmm. He, he, he needed some of the, the stability, some of the structure, like you mentioned. Yeah. Some of the continuity, right? Because those were like his habits and his routines. Without that you kind of lose a sense of who you are anymore, right. um, not just with basketball, but with your everyday process, right? Yeah. So that that reminded me of the Shmiko Holdsclaw, um, you know, episode that we did as well, because people can bring some of those things from stage one to stage two. Absolutely. It will help ease that transition. Yep. It also, I mean, you bring up a good point because one of the main – 
notes I had down as a takeaway was like the what were the barriers that he had to you know wellness after basketball right to that transition post basketball what were some of the things that were barriers or that got in the way of him being able to make a seamless transition and be in a good place mm-hmm. um one was the the just the stark contrast i mean it was clear that like his his pregame routine and his routine as a basketball player and all the things he did and the, and the intense i would say obsessive uh, visualization that was it's, it's so unique and then after he left basketball like all of that stuff was gone like gone. you said and that contrast is hard for it just makes adjustment impossible and i think that obviously didn't help i mean there's some other things going on with him clearly um that left him vulnerable but that was a major thing i also think you know along the lines of what were the barriers for him the men's playbook right the men's playbook and specifically um being from the black community i think we've had a few athletes talk about this where you know we think the stigma with regard to mental health and and guys getting mental health treatment or mental health awareness for guys has gone down Mm -hmm. um, which is great but I think you still see some pockets where there's there's kind of, you know, more than just being a guy going on. I think in the black community for a black man, you know, we've heard a lot of athletes talk about how it's, you know, it's often still not OK. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's considered weakness and you're not supposed to talk about it. Yep. Um, so I think that was clearly something that he talked about. And I would guess that along the lines of that barrier, you know, uh, we know how important it is with treatment to get connected with a therapist that, you know, if you want that, that you can connect with or like resonate with. And he actually uh, references working with like an older white lady yeah. and how like he ex- had expectations about like what that was going to be and it didn't match up and she just kind of let him talk, which is really cool. So I don't think it was a barrier for him, but I would imagine for some uh, for some people that if they can't find a therapist that they connect with or look like or that kind of thing, it might be a barrier to getting yeah. in. Um, there's not a lot of guys in the mental health profession. I, there's even fewer um, black men in, in the mental health profession. Mm-hmm. And so that is something that stood out as a barrier as well. Yeah, I think representation is huge. Yeah. I think the work can be done by anybody, totally. really. Yep. But it's the representation of if you are if you are a certain race and you're looking around, you don't see anyone doing that work. Yeah. It probably just adds to the, the, the barrier of like, well, then maybe I'm, if there aren't people that are doing the work, then maybe I don't need to do the work or yeah. things like that. I think that happens all the time. So yeah. I think representation in the field is huge but i think the work that can be done amy even says it like the that is sort of a stereotype in our business of Mm -hmm. like it's a lot of older white women and things like that and he he identifies that in his player tribute in his players tribune but then he when he got in there all the expectations of what he had kind of went out and he Mm -hmm. said it was great he just she just let me do my shit or talk my talk my piece or whatever and it really worked well for him yeah yeah absolutely and i think you know another takeaway for me was was a level of obsession you know he it's kind of interesting because I had a couple points on, on along the lines of obsession because he talks about how obsession allowed him to do positive visualization at like a whole different level. He even said like, quote unquote, that basketball rewards obsession. Mm-hmm. We see how like something that helped him as a player positioned him to struggle as, you know, in terms of his life after playing basketball. Yep. Um, and that also brings up, you know, how important positive visualization is. I know that's not like really how it related to him necessarily because it was tied into, I think, his bipolar and some other things. But mm-hmm. you see how effective it was for him to do that, you know, visualization of all 48 minutes, exactly what he's going to do, exactly how he's going to handle it. It allowed him to slip into that just focused, laser focused mode during the game yep. where he's not overthinking things. He is just letting his instincts take over mm-hmm. because he was physically prepared and he was mentally prepared. Right. Again, it went so far so that it, it left him vulnerable after his career. Mm-hmm. But I think for when one of the episodes we talked about how young guys tend to roll their eyes or young athletes tend to roll their eyes at the whole visualization piece. It's like this is an example of how that can like lock you in. Mm-hmm. You know, along the lines of obsession, he also he also made a connection. I think that was really kind of cool. I think he made this when he was in therapy at some point, but he made the connect. He realized that that doing something competitively and pushing yourself in that arena really makes, uh, you know, internalizing pain, pushing yourself through adversity really helps. But with mental health, it's a different arena entirely. And what that looks like, you know, that approach doesn't work. Yeah. And I think that's something he picked on, which I picked up on, which I thought was really cool. I don't want to diagnose him with a second thing here and speculate, but I've done a lot of work with OCD. It, it sounds he he mentions like religious or existential obsessions. He mentions the number 72. Mm-hmm. It sounds like there's maybe an overlapping kind of piece of OCD. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And I don't yeah. want to speculate, but um, the way he talks about obsession, I would guess there's something a little bit more than just bipolar kind of going on there. Um, so one thing that we've talked about a lot with athletes is like their, their life is a career and then their second acts like post sport. And that's kind of one, one takeaway that I have was in terms of like, his life after basketball really kind of came through, right? We talked about the big contrast. Um, 
one thing that stood out to me is that he he said he learned how to understand how to deal with failure, and that what what came to mind for me is that I think not only is dealing with failure, learning how to deal with failure important, but I think, and I want to know if you've seen this before, but like people who have not had to experience failure early on in their life are at a bit of a deficit mm -hmm. later on. I try to talk to to young guys that I work with about this a lot who are struggling with things and are making progress and are getting through you know, it's often hard for them to reframe that as a positive, right? Why would I want to go through this? Why is this a good thing? You know, that kind of thing. And what I try to say to them is like, look, I've, I've seen guys in their late 20s and early 30s and that kind of thing who have never gone through adversity in their life. And when it hits you when you have a full career and you have a family or kids or, or a spouse or that kind of thing, and that's the first time you've ever dealt with adversity, it's not a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. The fall is much more steep and you hit every pump on the way down. Mm -hmm. And then going through stuff when you're younger, going through some failure can actually really help you. It almost builds like a, an emotional, psychological immune system mm -hmm. to the, the stuff that life's going to throw at you. And he talks about how, I think he, he sort of speaks to how he never had to fail early on. I think he went through some, some difficult things in life, but from a basketball perspective, mm -hmm. he never really had to fail. He succeeded at every level. Yep. High school, you know, stand out, top 40 recruit in the nation. Uh, UConn for college won the national championship. You know, drafted third overall by the by the Bulls in the NBA and was uh you know a great NBA player. It positioned him for like when he, teams didn't want him anymore. That was something that was completely foreign to him. Mm -hmm. and he didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah, I think you see it all. The, I think you see it all the time. I think I think kids get conditioned from like a ridiculously early, early age of like why you shouldn't fail and do everything you can to not fail. And I think to your point, you make really good point of like if you do that you remove their opportunities to grow and to learn what do i what do i do when i fail yeah because it's not an if or it's a when question yes right it's yep. not a if i fail it's, it's a going when, to happen when, it's going to happen you are going to fail mm -hmm. and i think it kind of comes in two ways one you want to sort of help them the post failure of here's what you do to to to, to pick yourself mm -hmm. back up and keep moving forward and i think it's also about changing the perspective around failure and i think there's been lots of conversations you know, for a while about like changing the perspective, you know, the perspective of failure. And I, and I agree, it doesn't seem to be catching on. And I'm, I am always kind of curious about that, about like, what is it about failure specifically? And it's always people's top fail, like fears. When you start talking about mm -hmm. fears, it's all, I don't want to fail. Right. Why? What's, what's so, what is mm -hmm. so catastrophic about failure? I think it's because it goes against all of their conditioning through school, sports, whatever it is of like, you're not supposed to do this. And if you do, it's not great. Um, and I think it is a huge, you, it's a huge deficit to not have experience in that just like everything else, like rejection or, um, disappointment. If you don't have practice and how to respond mm -hmm. to that, you don't know what you're supposed to do when it, when it happens. Yeah. And not to say that you want to go out and promote failure, but it definitely, you want to, you are going to fail when you are pushing your comfort zone, when you're pushing your boundaries, when you're sort of extending yourself in a way of challenging yourself mm -hmm. or taking a, like a healthy risk, failure comes up as a part of that. And you, you, I mean, you don't have to search very far to talk to all these top CEOs to talk about their own failures and why it contributed to their success. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, failure can be a, a closed door or an open door. You yeah. just, you know, just, okay, that one didn't work. Let me go on to the next one. That one didn't work. Let me go on to the next mm -hmm. one. And, um, you know, so like an example, like JK Rowling took like 11 publishers to get Harry Potter published. Mm -hmm. Had she stopped after five, we wouldn't have Harry Potter. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so like having like, it's, that's just a way to approach failure of saying like, I'm just, I'm just going to keep going yep. that. Yes, that didn't work. Okay. Make some changes and continue to move on towards something that's meaningful. And I think mm -hmm. it's a conversation that we need to, maybe we could do a whole other episode on failure just as uh, in general, but it, it is a conversation I think needs to continue to, to happen because so many people won't do anything for that fear yeah. and getting them to understand like that's sorry, but that's like, that's a part of this process. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially if like for clients specifically, if they're doing well and they experience a failure, it's like this, tr you know, train off the tracks, mm -hmm. massive explosion. Like it's yeah. this whole big thing. It's like, well, no, that's part of the process. That's a good thing. Great. You failed at it. So you learned that's not how you want to do things. How mm -hmm. are we going to move forward and keep pushing? Yeah. And I think when, when people, I would guess part of it is, you know, there's the psychological impact of when you fail, it doesn't feel good. And I right. think we, we form psychologically, we form associations with that feeling. And so when you feel bad, when something happens, you now associate failure with feeling bad. And that's something that psychologically we uh, consciously or unconsciously want to avoid. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest reason why people avoid failure is because uh, we've talked about this in a couple other episodes a little bit, but they overlap their sense of self or their worth with the act. Yeah. And that can't happen. You know, you have to be able to detach. You know, your worth is an equation that has nothing to do with what you're trying to accomplish on a court or something. 
it has to do with like, all right, how do you treat the people in your life? Mm -hmm. How do you treat yourself? What is your work ethic like? What's in your control, right? That's self-worth, I think, is its own equation that's on this side. And then how you perform in a given act or on a given day or something like that where you're, you're trying to take a chance to do something new or difficult, that your worth is not on trial there. And right. it, it, there's no, good or bad. Like mm -hmm. you're, if, you, if you succeed, that doesn't change your worth. Mm -hmm. And if you fail, it doesn't change your worth. It's really got to be totally separate. I think especially young people, but people in general do not separate that. And that's what leaves them really vulnerable. Yeah. And I think with athletes, it's a particular, I mean, I guess with, with, with like high school kids in general too, but their entire worth, right? Like from a monetary standpoint is their performance, right? Mm -hmm. Specifically for athletes, they don't, they don't make money if they're not performing yep. well. And so yep. I think that that framework contributes and feeds that sense of like, that connection with my my personal identity to mm -hmm. my performance mm -hmm. because my my worth my yes. like yep. monetary worth or yep. value is actually attached mm -hmm. to how well I play and I, I think and when you're a young kid and you're getting that sort of ingrained in in, in you for a long 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 time of course you're going to internalize that yeah. th those two things and make that connection I think we need to find a different way you you know you brought up a good point of how like failure doesn't feel good and I want to try to come to a place of like failing means you're closer, yeah. right? Like, yeah. oh, wow, you're like right there, yep. right? Great, awesome, you failed, awesome. Yeah. You're really close, right? I want like, but for, you know, that's going to take a while. And, um, but I think that that's kind of where I'm hoping that the conversation around failure goes, that it's like, oh, wow, I failed. Not that you like have a big massive celebration, but that it's like, oh, wow, I'm closer, right? I'm closer to where I wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. And I found out a way that doesn't work for me. And now I get to talk about, move on to sort of figure out what is going to work for me moving forward. Yeah, and no, you make a great point because there, there really is way more helpful information within a failure than there yeah. is within a success and i don't think all fa failures are cut from the same cloth i mean i think the the whole zone of proximal development yeah. kind of comes into play here where yeah. it's like we've talked about how 20 percent out of your comfort zone is ideal if you're 100 percent out of your comfort zone and you fail miserably like you're probably not going to learn a whole lot from that. <laughs> it's just going to be like that was terrible yeah whereas if you're 20 percent out you're yeah, out of your comfort zone you're going to get some helpful information from that and the example i like to give for for people i work with is like if like let's say i'm working with like a 17 year old right who plays soccer if I had you play against a bunch of 10-year-olds playing soccer, how would that feel? Probably feel pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just destroy them and you'd score a million goals and it'd be great, right? Seems good in theory, but would you actually get better as a player? And the answer to that is always no, right? So short term, like, yeah, maybe you feel like you're a great player. But when you step back, you're like, did I actually learn anything? Mm -hmm. If anything, you, you at most you stayed stagnant, probably actually declined because yeah. you weren't facing good enough competition. Whereas if you play a bunch of 19 year olds, a couple, you know, D one soccer players above you, a little bit above your level, if you're high playing, you know, high level playing 17 year old in high school, it's going to be tough and it's not going to go well for you, but you are going to elevate your game because you were exposed to playing against them. Mm -hmm. And so what, what is the goal here? Is the goal to feel better? Or is the goal to get better? Because I think that's why you have to separate those two things. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to have your worth, uh, you know, be part of the equation every time you play a sport against people, you're, you're, you're leaving yourself pretty vulnerable. And that's on the good and the bad side. I think a lot of times, like you said, players who have been good at these things their whole life, it's part of their identity, and that's their main source of confidence. They yeah. feed off of the praise they get from all the people and the fans and everything else. And that can't be I, – I know it's hard to resist, especially for young people, but that's really something where you almost have to not listen to that. Mm -hmm. you, you have to, like, shut that out on the good side because they're not telling you anything that's accurate. Your worth is not who you are as a basketball player. And so I, it's hard for people that are young especially to, like, resist the urge, to, like, love the limelight and that kind of thing. I think if they're able to do that a little bit when things are going well, mm -hmm. then they're not going to care as much when things are not going well. Yeah. So um, we got off on a, on a failure tangent there, but I think yeah. that's a great topic, and, and it is something that we're going to get into a lot more. Um, you know, one, uh, with regard to his second act, you know, post-basketball, um, one thing that stood out to me is just the, the – the, he used a new strength to let go of, of an old strength. And what I mean by that is like he realized – he finally said, uh, quote, don't fight it. Learn about yourself in this space. And I learned a lot. I realized I was bullshitting a lot about a lot of things. I learned to do the opposite of what I was doing. So to me, this, this speaks to like him – using this uh, second type of strength to get rid of the first strength, right? Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about how, you know, a lot of times with the mental health conversation, people say like, all right, well, well, real strength is opening up about stuff. And, you know, staying closed off is not real strength. And I think we, we used to think that too. And I think as we've talked about more, we realized like, 
they're both types of strength. Mm -hmm. One is probably a little bit smarter for overall wellness than the other. And so I think what he's doing is he's taking this new type of strength, the strength of being willing to be vulnerable and open up about your problems. He's using that strength to let go of the old strength, like the old strength being like the walls up, men's playbook, stoic, not going to admit anything's wrong, you know, uh, don't show weakness, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so he he finally embraces the fact that, okay, I have to be vulnerable and really learn about myself in this way in order to have this new strength to get through. Because that old strength, the one that I've been using all along, is not going to help me post-basketball, right? right? So um, we're going to transition a little bit to the to the bipolar conversation. I, I know one thing that we can't really get into too much, but I did, did want to touch on is just how common trauma is with a lot of people's experience with regard to mental health and whether it's, I think, bipolar. There's We don't know exactly what causes it, which we'll get into, but he does say that I still have trauma I'm not ready to tell the world about yet. So I'm yeah. guessing that he went through some some things when he was younger, mm-hmm. um, you know, that were that obviously had an impact on him on, on many different levels. So I think that, you know, it's just we don't want to get into that because we can't speculate. But I do I do think it's important to continue to revisit how, how common trauma is. I think the more we do episodes, the more it stands out, like how everybody has, like most people have gone through some type of trauma. Right. Um, so we're going to get into to bipolar a little bit here. Um, as a mental health topic, as we discussed, bipolar is something that, you know, we, we cover mental fitness, mental health, mental illness. We really try to cover all three of those. So sometimes we're going to get into some, some diagnostic terms and some mm-hmm. things that are labels and, and that are mental, uh, example of mental illness. Um, the bipolar disorder is also something that has woven through a couple of the players that we've talked about in an interesting way. Cause, it, cause it, it almost like propelled them to, in some way to excel at their craft. And then on the flip side of that, left them very, very vulnerable for life after the sport. Right. So I want to kick it to you, John, just to talk about, you know, what is bipolar? Yeah. And so, and just, just to one comment based on that, yeah. you know, in Ben even talked about that, um, about how like when in his work with his therapist about identifying, and you, you touched on this too, like the habits that helped get him to the league are not going to translate. Yeah outside and i thought that that was a really important important piece but that sort of information is what came from from his work through working with a therapist mm-hmm. so um when we're talking about bipolar again kind of to bring it back to the beginning of the episode when we talked about the importance of language i think you know we can get bogged down in the clinical stuff and i'll try to make it as friend as as listener friendly as possible kind of going through some of this stuff but i do think that it's important for people to get a really under a clear understanding of like what bipolar is mm-hmm. To try to minimize the conversations around like, oh, you're being so bipolar, or like, oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm so bipolar, and you know, I, I understand where it kind of comes from, but I think it's it's important to use the appropriate language for this for the given circumstance. Yeah. So, with bipolar, there's 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 two types. There's bipolar one and there's bipolar two. Um, and bipolar one is consists of manic episodes. I'll, I'll get into what mania looks like and what a manic episode qualifies as. Mm-hmm. Um, but it consists of a manic episode lasting at least a week and then depressive episodes, which I'll talk about in just a second for at least two weeks. Yep. Typically, it lasts a little bit longer. And then you get like a quote unquote normal state and then the cycle can kind of repeat. Okay. Um, and that's bipolar one. Uh, bipolar two is similar, but the symptoms just aren't as severe or long lasting. Mm-hmm. So bipolar one is like typically... A little bit more disruptive in terms of daily functioning, so those those manias are really high, and those depressive pieces are really low, and they usually last a little bit longer. With bipolar two, it's a little bit different, um, a little bit less severe, or mm-hmm. like I said, long lasting. Mm-hmm. So when we get into manic episodes, um, that's really defined as you know inflated self esteem or grandiosity or um, feelings of grandeur, like in, I'm invincible, mm-hmm. I can't be touched, I can do whatever. Um, decreased need for sleep. This is a huge one. Yeah. So you'll get people saying like, I don't need to sleep. I'm up. I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm this. I can do this. I can do for all these projects for times. days yeah. at a time. They just won't sleep. Yeah. Um, and you get like very repetitive, like very repetitive and, you know, fast talking. Um, like they'll do like meaningless projects or things like that that have no purpose, but just sort of like to put all that energy into. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, a lot more talkative um, or th- like unusual talking patterns is sort of something that comes up or sort of like call it free association. So it might be something like, um, you know, you're just talking out loud, just stream of conscious, like no, there's no real sense or point to it. Um, and distractibility. So attention's just like all, you know, all over the place or, or zeroed in on a specific thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then excessive involvement in like activities. So you're just like in everything doing, doing all the things at once. Um, and typically you need about five of those, um, criteria, there's seven, five of those criteria to sort of qualify as like a manic episode, mm-hmm. um, which I think surprises a lot of people because 
when we again mania is like one of those things like oh you're being so manic right it's a, it's another one of those examples of of words that get sort of like tossed around as like it's like a synonym for moody basically. moody yeah right yeah. exactly and it's that's just how not, it's used it's not supposed to be but right yeah. exactly yeah. so um and then depressive episodes same thing there's sort of like criteria that they need to qualify in order to sort of you know get a depressive episode um and same thing with mania there's usually there's five or more um criteria that sort of goes and it's a depressed mood indicated by a subjective report or observation by others so like other people are making identifications mm-hmm. that that's happening loss of interest in th- not just a loss of interest but even the things that used to bring you joy or pleasure mm-hmm. no real interest in that mm-hmm. sleep again um usually like hypo sleeping so sleeping like you know can sleep 12 14 hours a day um or disturbances in sleep or things like that so it could be insomnia but it could be you know the opposite of that as well so this is where you start to see like where the the two poles kind of come in right it's mm-hmm. just like one is is not sleeping and is like all keyed up and, and doing yeah. all these things and the and the other is like this fall to the complete opposite pole right uh, of what they were just experiencing and that's where the bipolar comes in yeah exactly can't yeah. get out of bed things like that yep. um so and then depressive pieces too like senses of worthlessness recurrent thoughts of death self-harm um those are sort of a lot of the the criteria for like a depressive depressive episode and if you meet at least five of those and with mania as well, that sort of gets to qualify you for that bipolar diagnosis. And then from there, you go into a severity, frequency, pieces like that to determine whether it's bipolar 1 or bipolar 2. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is important to get an accurate diagnosis because treatment can be very different yeah. um, for how that how that plays out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, I remember the first time that I ever worked with a client who came into a session in a manic state. And I thought I knew, you know, what what you know, a state of mania was, and I had no idea because when you see it in person, it really does stand out. I think not that we want to like, you know, fixate on that. And I know people probably, I hope people don't ever have to see what that's like because it's not a, a, a fun thing to experience seeing someone you know or care about, especially in that state. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not, the the moodiness thing is definitely the synonym people think it is. Like, oh, you know, I, I get mad and uh, and I, I get depressed, so I must be bipolar. And I think that's where, like, a lot of parents think that, too. They think if, they're, if their kid has some anger issues at times and is also experiencing some sadness and or depression, that they must be bipolar. And I think, like, it, that is not what it is at all. Um, and I think that gets thrown around, you know, way too often. A- anger is not mania. Um, no. And no, you know, it, it just so different i think from um if anything when people are in a manic state the anger tends to not be the, the main thing that kind of comes through it's kind of like a, a carelessness i can take over the world kind right of thing exactly more than it is like um uh, an anger or madness towards people or, mm-hmm. or, or that kind of thing so i think it's definitely thrown out way too often and we thought it was, it was good to cover this kind of thing yeah. uh, so you covered bipolar one and bipolar two um, you know, let's talk about treatment a little bit. I mean, you, you mentioned how accurate diagnosis is so key. Mm-hmm. I think, me- you know, medication is really the only thing that can handle the manic side. Um, you're not going to be able to do any kind of form of therapy that's going to change that because right. it's more about neurological functioning and how mm-hmm. the brain's working. So they tend to put a person with bipolar on like a mood stabilizer or an antipsychotic, and that handles the manic side of, of their swings. And then sometimes they're on an antidepressant medication yeah. um, for the depression side. And whether they are or they're not, I think that's where therapy tends to be the, the most helpful is that, um, you know, we do a lot of CBT and, and, and things like that in terms of working with, with the depressive side of, of, uh, of bipolar. And I think it's uh, – you'll probably see that a combination of medication and, and therapy for the depressive side is probably mm-hmm. the best way to go. That's what research shows. Um, but it's, it, it requires working with professionals. I really do, really do have to get an accurate diagnosis and get with the right team a psychiatrist who can prescribe, yep. um, someone who understands that diagnosis to, um, because it's not always with medication. It's not always the first go that works. Sometimes you got to try different things and, and they have to find what works for each person. Yep. Um, so we also did an episode on depression, which I think people, if they're listening and they want to know more about like, you know, help for the depressive side, we have an episode on DeMar DeRozan and depression. That I think people would find helpful mm-hmm. in terms of what, if they're st- struggling with depression, whether it's bipolar related or, or just not related to bipolar, um, that they can listen to that episode. And it's very helpful. And I think the Simone Biles and mental fitness episode is probably helpful for that too, because a lot of what we do with depression is like, you know, reactive versus proactive strategies. And I think a proactive example of treating depression is looking out for your self-care and mental fitness and mm-hmm. doing things, you know, really investing in yourself so that you're able to uh, guard against, uh, you know, life's events and, and challenges and adversities and things like that. 
Um, so any other uh, suggestions for someone dealing with bipolar or on that topic? Yeah, no, I mean, you touched on the big ones. Like I think, um, you know, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is sort of a little bit more like skills training and, um, you know, identify the irrational thoughts that are sort of leading to the unwanted behaviors mm -hmm. and replacing those with like, why are you doing those things? And could we be doing something different? I think that's yeah. a really effective approach. And then a lot of times with bipolar, I focus a lot on like sleep and exercise. And like you talked about, like implementing more healthy habits and routines into the daily function from a proactive standpoint, mm -hmm. you obviously have to manage the the reactive states or the the stuff where like those triggers that cause that, that could be causing some of that stuff. But um, definitely the proactive approach is found, at least personally, I found it to be a little bit more beneficial for clients in terms of working with them, of giving them like, here's some things to be doing to hopefully not dive too deep into that place. And like you said too, pharmaceuticals is usually always the best approach for mm -hmm for that because you can't really treat someone in a manic state no information is really getting in and the yeah. same thing if someone's in a deeply depressive state it's it's really really hard to get movement and treatment and so having the medication to put them in you know it's not like you're making these people catatonic you're just stabilizing the peaks and values yep, like the exactly. peaks and values yeah, of, of the, get of more the, neutral yeah. right so that the information that you're talking about can actually be retained mm -hmm. and utilized rather than uh, same thing you're talking to someone who's manic it's it it's not what you probably think it is it's yeah. it is very intense and have trying to have a conversation with someone who's manic is kind of it's not going to happen mm -hmm. um you know there's been examples you know um kanye west has been someone who's talked about his bipolar and there's like the tmz interview where he was just like ranting nonsense and yep. things like that like that would be sort of an example of something where someone's like that stream of consciousness yeah, where there's no a, likely in a manic state right yeah, likely yeah. in a manic state yeah. so that's sort of some of the stuff that we're we're talking about specifically yeah yeah absolutely and it is something that affects uh close to three percent of the population which i didn't know is that even that high yeah um and i think from what i've seen you know two-thirds of people with bipolar have one close relative with either bipolar or depression so right. it is something that um you know, tends to run in families either you know, in terms of, you know, being hereditary or just because when you're around a person that has that, uh, it's probably going to impact you, right. which can uh, leave you vulnerable, be traumatic to you and, mm -hmm. and leave you vulnerable. Yeah, it's a risk um, factor for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think 60% of people with bipolar also struggle with substance abuse or substance misuse issues. So yeah. um, that's relative as well. So that's that's it for today. We want to uh, encourage people, you know, to find us on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and search the Grim Drive podcast. Uh, we are still trying to get to 100 subscribers, Johnny. Come on, um, people. I know. Help us out here. <laughs> um, so we can get our own custom URL. If we get 100 subscribers on YouTube, we get to have a custom URL to make it easier for people to find us. Uh, one other reminder, all the helpful information and links that we described in the episode can be accessed in our show notes and on our website at grimdrive.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Grim Drive podcast for our discussion about Ben Gordon and bipolar. We'll be back next week to talk about Brandon Marshall.